Hey, Soul Boom Generation, I've got a really exciting announcement for you. We've got a Substack. If you love the Soul Boom podcast and book and ideas, then you're going to want to get our weekly newsletter Substack sent to your inbox. It's magnificent. There's going to be fantastic uh, guest authors. Some are written by me. A lot of them delve into the ideas around the podcasts that we're doing that week. So sign up, please subscribe. Go to soulboom.substack.com. Thank you. After the demise of Chappelle Show, I used to carry around a list of good things I'd done. Sort of a self-esteem booster. What was on that list? It was certain jokes, certain sketches, certain parts of movies, certain, you know what I mean? Like, oh, Was it the day you handed out sandwiches to homeless people or anything like that? Or just, yeah. just comedy and sketches? Grow up. <laughs> Hey there, it's me, Rain Wilson, and I want to dig into the human experience. I want to have conversations about a spiritual revolution. Let's get deep with our favorite thinkers, friends, and entertainers about life, meaning, and idiocy. Welcome to the Soul Boom Podcast. Well, the interesting thing that I don't really talk about much is, and I'm not going to today, I'm kidding, uh, the, is that when the TV show got picked up, when Chappelle show got picked up, I knew I can't go to therapy anymore. I can't go to 12 step meetings anymore because I knew I wasn't going to be able to have a healthy life and healthy boundaries and make a great TV show. Was that the naivete of a 27 year old? No, I think that... I was absolutely right. You think you were right. I think that. I was absolutely right. I couldn't do the show correctly or or as well as we were able to do it and have boundaries i i swear to I you i think that's kind of silly i'm I, sorry I, fine seriously it, what's done is done yeah and you made one of the most brilliant the, comedy shows right. of all time yeah. so, so one of the things that i remember dave telling conan o'brien conan goes who are you writing the show with and he goes eh, one guy and conan goes don't do that <laughs> and what he meant is it's too hard again it's not the best advice i would give to somebody but yeah. if i'd had boundaries i probably would have only worked 11 hours a day but with no boundaries you can push it to 17 <laughs> over and over and over and i could edit for 48 hours straight and conan was right and you're also right meaning you see how it ends yeah. So it's like, yeah, no, that was not, that was too, that was a, that was the wrong approach. Do you think that if you had been in therapy and in 12 step and had healthy boundaries and only worked 11 hours a day and hired five other of the greatest comedy writers you could find to assist on the show, that the show would have been 10 to 15% less funny? Mm hmm. If not 25 to 30. Wow. All right. The, it, I can't explain. It's like somebody said to, my friend Bijan, who edited it, and we're still friends, and he's still we still do stuff together. But somebody said, "How was the show good?" And he goes, "Cause we watched every frame of the every frame, and then decide." And that takes that's not how people do it. They go, uh, "Get some selects," and then yeah. I'll go through the selects and I'll tell you how to rent. Yeah, it, you know, it takes it's easier. It is uh, you can protect your family, protect your yeah. Um, mental health but it's 20 20 percent worse yeah so in some ways it's a bit of um but there's a lot of artists that i guess would fall into that category i mean would john coltrane have been as good no. without heroin I have, it's would a jackson whole bit pollock I have. been yeah, as good no. without you know gallons I have a whole of bit alcohol? about it in the special about like do, the, do the best bit. in the do the bit okay so then i come out there and i uh <laughs> so then i'm saying it like this uh no it's just about the craziest the best person at any sport is the craziest. The be Michael Jordan is not a healthy person. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then music, comedy. Comedies are a litany of maniacs. It's just a litany of maniacs. So, litany of maniacs. So one of the jokes is like, well, Neil, are you saying that all comedians are psychopaths and drug addicts? And I'm like, so far. <laughs> Once I heard Mark Twain was bipolar, I was like, oh. Oh, this okay. all makes sense. So Arthur Brooks, he's happy yeah, and professor. Yeah, all stuff. Really, yeah. yeah where he talked about something called emotional caffeine. Mm -hmm. So caffeine is a drug that it is not actually a stimulant, 
it, it is it this, blocks something, right? Yeah, it's this. It, it blocks the thing that makes you drowsy. Mm -hmm. So it blocks the drowsy. Close stuff. enough, caffeine. <laughs> caffeine, close enough. And so he said, emotionally, there are emotional caffeines. There are there are emotions that you can feel, and when you, for instance, if you're feeling despair, if you express gratitude, if you send a gratitude list, you journal about gratitude. Mm -hmm. It literally blocks despair. And he said for stand-up comics the, and, and for comic actors and people yeah, in comedy, getting laughs. that the emotional caffeine for depression and sadness is humor. Mm -hmm. Because you cannot be laughing and feel depressed at the same time. Watch me. I'm kidding. <laughs> so there's this dance. Because I, when I think about that and I think about my youth and I used to memorize you know, a Monty Python mm -hmm. routines and Steve Martin routines and say them and joke with our friends. And I had a, you know, I had a kind of a sad upbringing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wasn't uh, beaten in my childhood like you. I didn't have it that bad, but yes, yeah. I occasionally caught some. You caught some, yeah. you caught some belt, some Irish sure, belt. Sure, sure. Yeah. So were you a sad clown using uh, comedy to counteract as emotional caffeine, uh, your sadness and depression that you've spoken about yeah. ad nauseum. Oh, this one's got no emotional content. I have a new special coming out soon that's got no emotional content. Uh, yeah, I used to, after the demise of Chappelle Show, the, um, I used to carry around a list of good things I'd done as um, and a, a, a sort of a self-esteem booster. What, were, what was on that list? It was certain jokes, certain sketches, Certain parts of movies, certain, you know what I mean? Like, but was it the day you handed out sandwiches to homeless people or anything like that? Or just, just comedy and sketches? Grow up. <laughs> um, yeah, it, w it was all personal achievements. Okay. And the thing that nobody ever says is personal achievements can make you feel pretty good. Yeah. And they can last a long time. It's you are, your self esteem is better because you did The Office forever. You, Your there baseline is, is there higher. There is nothing wrong with healthy self-esteem. It can be denigrated by people that view it coming from a spiritual lens as like uh, ego, and it can be denigrated in terms of uh, people thinking of it as like narcissism or unhealthy, but there's nothing wrong with the fact of like, hey, I did these achievements, I came through these obstacles, and I did X, Y, and Z, and I feel pretty damn good about that. Yeah. And I feel pretty good about that as the office. You know, I was this screwed up guy and, and annoying and, and difficult and, and, and struggling and character actor, and 14, 15 years into my career, I got to play Dwight Schrute, and people really like the role, and it's kind of legendary as witnessed by walking into any Target store and seeing it on any mugs and, and kitchen towels and bath mats. Yeah. And so, you know, good, good, good for you, Rain. Yeah, for real. Good for you. I don't think I feel the narcotic that, you know, it's my friend Jimmy Carr does a sort of, not even a bit, but he says like, I'm a drug dealer and you have the drugs on you. I just say things that can release the drugs and oxytocin, dopamine, and all that stuff. So I love that. Yeah. And so I will say Could a that, stripper say the same thing? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. She, yes, yeah. he could. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I believe. Yeah, it's the same basic idea. So mm -hmm. so I I think maybe other people get it more than I do, but I get certainly a flood of something. Mm -hmm. Not, you know, in a conversation, but at a theater show or whatever, like I get a big, I mean, I, I did the, I was telling somebody this the other day when, when blocks came out, I was walking down the street and I looked at my phone and saw all the positive things. And I just went and I met, I felt yeah. it, yeah. you know what I mean? So it was a feel good emotion. I don't know. I don't know which one of those sons of bitches it was, but it was, it was one of them. So if you hadn't gone into comedy, would you be dead? No, I'd just be a very frustrated, angry, uh, editor or something a journalist yeah maybe not journalist but but just because it's too hard but and no one believes you anymore <laughs> pretty great you travel all over the world and you're haggard and no one believes you uh and people say what you do is fake so <laughs> i don't think i'd be dead per se but you know in some ways i feel like the pursuit of showbiz might be unhealthy in the first place like if i'd never gone into it 
I wouldn't have all these very conditional ways of getting love. There are very few people that I've ever met in my entire career, uh, and Steve Carell is one of the very few that haven't gone into show business for some really unhealthy reason. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, it was like, like me. Mm -hmm. I hope you love me. Hey, yeah. you know, I, w I want the hugs and the dopamine and the high fives and... And but nobody gets, no one, Will Smith, Tom Cruise, the big movie stars, nobody gets it forever. You you know, Tom Cruise is just doing sequels now. Did you see the last one, though? It was so good. The motorcycle over the train, it was amazing. I mean, I'm not kidding. Oh, I'm no, I need the, the Mission Impossible. It, it, it was so good. I saw the Top Gun one and I was like, yeah, but I, yeah. but when people think you kind of, the point yeah, is I know people get to like, well, now I'm set. It's not set. He's yeah. worried. He's yeah. worried about keeping it up. Yeah. So it's all, it's a, uh, it's fool's gold that some people manage to get a continuous supply of, but it's still kind of fool's gold. Yeah. And to the, to my earlier point, doesn't, it sort of prevents much of a personal life. Jim Carrey had a great joke about that when he was accepting a Golden Globe award and which is like, oh, now I'm happy. Oh, I've got this. Now everything is going to be great. And it was, and I felt the same way when I was in the office. And I've talked about this in a bunch of podcasts. People loved it when I'm, you talked about it. And they, they went apeshit. They and I'll that. probably talk about it on your podcast, which is, you know, I'm on the office. I'm shooting movies. I'm making millions of dollars. People adore me and the character. I'm hosting SNL. And I spent many years being like, why don't I have three movies lined yeah. up? Why don't I have X million dollars? Why don't I have a development deal at Warner Brothers? Where are my universal NBC offices? Where? And so it's the never enoughness yeah. that is to the Buddhist, the, the essence of what that suffering imbalance is that we're all on a journey to rectify. Yeah, uh, most of us are in too deep. You know, what do you, wh hey Rain, what are you gonna do? <laughs> to, are you are you are you putting the old the old script down forever are you I, putting the i could do it right now could you i could walk away 100 percent. i got one last score it's in my <laughs> this is it is this podcast yeah, no I, but i, I could do i could move to a farm on montana right now and i could be happy and you you and your days would be occupied and you'd i could do beekeeping and pottery and i could be happy my wife thinks that i'm nuts for saying so but i really truly believe that I we I have a joke with friends when they go, you know what? I'm gonna move to the country, and open a juice bar, and it's like <laughs> you're a fucking phony, and people in the country aren't gonna like you. <laughs> so this idea of like the no, you're gonna be. They don't have nail salon. There's so many things they don't have there that you're you built your life around, <laughs> and you're gonna be miserable, and no one's gonna like you. And you're going to tell about like, well, in L.A., that's all you're going to start every conversation. I don't know if that applies. I don't know. I, you, well, you live out in the sticks a little bit here. Yeah, so. I got pigs. Yeah. The only people that really kept touring were Joan Rivers, who ended up having $150 million in the bank when she died. So she traveled. And she gave it all to poodles. Yeah. It's something. She gave it to her daughter. And Leno still does it. Yeah. He does corporate. Private. And, yeah. But and, they, yeah. again, it's easy at that tax bracket is my point. It's at a certain point you go, uh, am I going to keep getting, going to the airport and all that stuff? Yeah. I entertain that fantasy and I go, I'm just going to go read or any of those <laughs> things. It's just like, dude, people, you, you moved here for a reason. So my impetus for comedy, I think, is anger and a little like get back, meaning I consider my voice to be... Uh, Hey, may I say something? <laughs> like there's just just this ah, ah, culture, and I go, hey, um, can I can, just can, may I? <laughs> yeah, I may hurt some of your feelings. Maybe I won't, but like, can we? I, my my point of view is this. So it is a bit of you you know. Hey, I'd like to interject. But two things. Number one, I don't know you very well. We've only spoken briefly a few times. I've obviously seen all of your specials, but you have a deep and abiding uh, relish meant of a really good, well put joke with exactly the right words. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it's a deep 
it's like to your core. I can just see it in the way yeah. that you make comedy. Yeah, but it's from li- being a doorman at a comedy club in New York, and it's like Louis, David Tell, Chappelle, John Stewart, Ray Romano are regular, not doing well, and there's a there's a premium put on good writing. So, and I've always been like clever since I was a kid. So, so I do think it should be well done. And it, I do like it when people respect it. But I think there's a holiness in that kind of craftsmanship. Yeah. The, uh, Whether you're a maybe there's something sacred or, yeah. you're, or there, or you're a stand up comic, yeah. but just that, like the relishing, the deep relishing of like, Oh, this, table is just joined mm-hmm. perfectly or the mm-hmm. the way that i phrased that one joke yeah well my jokes have also have to be perfect because i'm a little uh charisma deficient so i have to get people on like ah you, you, Chappelle has amazing charisma you should just write for him I, fuck do you do you have a way of getting in touch with him <laughs> yeah, I think um so. yeah no so i so that is i do i'm working and I do structural things and I like use the whole pig as it were. Like I'm going to have three don't mics say, and I'm going to have that. a shadow and I'm going to say, I know your whole pig. pig Cause those are your friends. That's your family. Um, so I still eat pork. I still eat bacon, by the way. It's like, I'm, I have a pet pig. I'm vegan. I'm, I'm vegan. Sometimes I'm vegetarian. And it's like, well, how do you justify milking a cow? It's like, everybody got to work. Cow. <laughs> everybody got to get to work. Cow. I got a job too, cow. <laughs> Go give go to the go to the dairy farm and that cow squirt. has a deep relishment in providing the most beautiful lactose for your enjoyment. Look, I'll take your word for it because that's your life. But but yeah, so I do. The jokes have to be well structured, and yeah, there's something. I'm not. I don't want to be shitty at comedy. It's too. It's too great. Yeah, but it's deeper than that. It's uh, what I'm getting at is a little bit deeper than that. Of course, you don't want to be shitty. And of yeah. course you want to tell good jokes and make people laugh. But I can tell that there is a, just a delight in just a certain like, oh, I phrased that. And it's just, it's like when you make a paper airplane, you don't know what you're doing and you throw it and it just soars. And you're like, wow, I did that. What a, yeah, yeah, that, I'd say that's true. It's what not it, a thing I'm very aware of. It's not a thing I think about other than like the, the goal is like this shit has to work. Fair so enough. and and then revision 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 because i it can work better i have a joke that i need one more beat for and it's taken me up six weeks and i'm still like every time try a different and like the one that works goes Does any, is do you have any examples that come to mind sorry to sorry to uh, put you on the spot it's probably a terrible question no, no it's to not ask. bad i have a bit in blocks the how liberal are you game show right it's where it's like you're at a, you're at an airport and a Muslim looking man asks you to watch his luggage while he prays. And it's like, <laughs> how liberal are you? And I'm like, ah, I, I tried other ones. Okay. <laughs> I just didn't, it was like, you're dealing with like length. You're dealing with rhythm. You're dealing with like, could I have done two more visualization? Probably. I just couldn't. That was my limit. I mm-hmm. tried other. So, you know, and at one point I didn't even have that. So, that's an example of exa- or example like i'm doing small reshoots for my special on monday and i'm like people are still pitching me jimmy carr pitched me stuff on the way here and i'm like and i would have to write it would take me too long to do them correctly so so there is an ongoing better 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 your two specials three mics and blocks uh center on uh mental health struggles Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways and you have uh in your comedy become incredibly revealing and dived as deep as humanly possible into your vulnerabilities and fears and struggles you've been on innumerable podcasts talking about uh your treatment for depression how did that come about where you're writing sketches that are really about a lot about race and cultural criticism, and then you turn to your more personal kind of comedic journey, all of a sudden going to coffee houses and driving to Irvine and Brea and uh, you know spending five or six years building a comedy career, and you then are revealing 
a lot of stuff about yourself that 99% of comics would never reveal. And in a weird way, you're a trailblazer in that regard. I'd always been concerned with mental health. I mean, Mike Sher wrote, sold a movie in 1998. And we were writing it at my house in New York and we'd go to Central Park every day and walk around and I just started taking Zoloft. And I remember talking to him about it and I remember talking to Dave about it, Chappelle. And I was like, I, Zoloft worked for me. And I remember saying to Dave, like, I don't want to dance, but I understand why people would. Whereas before that, I had no, it was like, what are you people doing? <laughs> so I'd always been interested in it and talked to them about it. Chappelle is a joke where he's like, he wants to write a book about me called just drink <laughs> so i was always concerned with it i do um i start doing stand-up i do an hour on comedy central it's, it's fun funny somebody just texted me a joke from it while we we're sitting down like it's i thought it was pretty good and people just didn't care i was like okay i'm not gonna keep doing this to no avail i don't want to keep People do. It seems like people don't care if I do this or not, which right there is sort of like, yeah, that's you have to keep going. People don't care. People didn't care about you for 15 years. People didn't care. Like, but I thought I need to tell people why I'm not smiling and charismatic. So I, that's basically <laughs> the impetus for, for free mics is like, okay, let me just tell you what it's like to be me. Cause people either thought, I was an interloper. I'd been handed a comedy career. I wasn't qualified to make the TV show with Dave. I wasn't technically qualified, but if you do it and it's great, turns out you were qualified. So, which people don't accept from certain people. So, I was trying to get popular in a weird way, like, and novel. I knew I would have had to do it with novelty. So, the three mics thing was that. And I would listen to the moth and these podcasts and live shows and be like, Oh, I wonder if I could, what would I talk about? Mm. And then it came from that. So, so that was sort of the point. And I'm the youngest in my family, youngest of 10 people. So youngest 10 kids. So when I would take Zoloft, I was like a trailblazer blazer in my family where they'd all be like, wait, what are you, are you going to take those forever? What are you doing? It was like, you know, what in the 70s they would call gay. <laughs> hey, everybody. It's me, Rain. I want to share something with you. I have gone through periods of my life where I have felt a little bit lost in the chaos, in the anxiety. I often am searching for some clarity. So I want to share something really special. It's an app called Waking Up. This is founded by the great Sam Harris. You've heard of Sam Harris. He's also a neuroscientist. And Waking Up is an incredible arsenal, is the best way to describe it, of mindfulness, meditation, so many resources for mental health, all grounded in secular techniques. And it has approaches baked into it that actually work. There's so many different tools for my spiritual toolbox, and I really can't recommend it more highly. Soul Boom listeners can get their first month for free, plus you'll save $30 on the in-app price. If you go to wakingup.com slash soulboom, you can start your free month today. That's wakingup.com slash soulboom to get a free month plus $30 off. Were you the first in your, ther in your family to have therapy too? Yes, and but not the most in need of it. <laughs> <laughs> but I was the first one to really go, uh, well, here's a good, my dad went to therapy when I was in college and he started taking Prozac and he stopped because it was making him be too nice to people. So he, he drew the line. Okay. That's about <laughs> enough of this kindness. Um, so I didn't mind. And then my family was a little, my sister told me a conversation she had with one of my other sisters the other day where somebody said something she, in her family. She was like, it's so embarrassing. And my sister goes, did you see three mics? as being some form of embarrassment for my family. But I think most of them came to realize that I just went first because people it's in a 12 step meeting opening person shares a 10 minute share. And then everybody does like a two to three minute riff on the opening share. And that's, and everybody grows because of it. And I knew that I was doing the first share. 
if you watch three mics, you must have been like, this is just a share. This is just a this is just a twelve yeah, step share. Yeah, I hadn't thought of it. That yeah, way. that's yeah. exactly yeah. what it is. Yeah. So, so and I and I tell people all the time, I've never been to a bad twelve step meeting. They're all pretty riveting. Yeah, at least yeah. It, they're at least interesting, and they can be. You'll always get something out of transcendent the experience. Yeah, yeah, it can be transcendent, yeah. or at least it's like, well, I've never heard this. I've heard people got murdered, and like, yeah. I've heard things that are insane. So, and for me, sometimes it's like, and I, sometimes you don't hear any of that. And it's kind of boring. And then at the end of it, you're like, this was just that. what I needed. Yep. Yeah. Here I am. I'm just another bozo on the bus with all of these bozos on the bus. And we're all in it together and suffering. And we're just going to go for one more day. Here we go. Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's beautiful. Yeah. It's not like the main um, frequency in your brain, like the main voice over the main appraiser it's some it's in the groundwater the quality of 12 step meetings to me so that was that made me i was kind of doing it it was just genre mixing and and confession and stand up and so and it was cool and i it worked was there any element at all about this is important and this will make a necessary impact. Uh, look, reading Solboom, the the there thanks is for, thanks for referencing. Yeah, yeah, the there is an element to it that I read it and I'm like, look, man, I'm with you, but influencing people's hard. And you ever try to influence yourself? How long does that take yeah. to change Decade. yourself? Decades. Yeah. It takes yeah. decades. So yeah. I'm all, f I would love a consciousness uh, transfer or transition or, or awakening. Or it's, it's just very hard. These, the bodies we're in are very, they don't like change. They just don't like it. They want to do the thing they want, which is like, it, you just pull to the left or you pull, to the, you know, you yeah. tend to be angry. You tend to be, and it's impossible to break. I try to be humble about stuff like that. I don't, I don't think it would have helped if I thought it was important. I think I would have been, um, it would have just been really pretentious. This guy, Frederick Buchner, once said, uh, the place where God lives is where your great delight and the world's great hunger meet. So your great delight is making people laugh, proving yourself as a comedian, mm -hmm. and the world's deep hunger in this day and age, is to hear about a weird-looking, depressed comedian who overcame all of these obstacles to make great comedy and to share your soul in a hysterical way, and it's made an incredible impact. So I, uh, yeah. The the other thought I had is like it's so flooded now yeah. with with. Like Everyone's the market is about saturated it. and it's, it's, you know, trauma's overused. It's everything's all, every word in this area is completely overused and, and it I, makes it like, and I do think that it's not it's like having a smoothie shop. And I, I do think that in a lot of ways, all of this mental health talk, uh, in some ways doesn't do young people any favors it does in the fact that like, oh, they're like, oh, look at all these famous idols that I've had that have had huge mental health struggles. And that's very helpful. But if you're living your life through the lens of like, I'm anxious, I'm depressed, I'm lonely, I'm a misfit, I'm traumatized, yep. that can hold you back. And you really, uh, like very few people I've met in Hollywood have had these kind of very real setbacks due to your depression. Mm. and have overcome it can you just talk a little bit about that yeah i'm so it was you always, tried every treatment i under was the sun. always i got in how 90, debilitating was it for you it's just dysthymia is what i got diagnosed in in 1998 and what is that it's inability to experience joy okay and but didn't it go deeper than that sometimes no, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, but I, but yeah, it's hard when your partner leave. It's hard when you ha are think your identity is one thing and it's taken away. It's hard when you feel like a, a generationally misfit. I have had things that are worthy of 
self-pity or any kind of pity, but self is my favorite. Um, I tried uh, probably five different antidepressants. I tried, because Zoloft stopped working at a certain point. I tried transcranial magnetic stimulation. I tried- That's magnets on the skull. That's, uh, they sh fire a magnet at a certain, they fire an MRI beam at a certain part of your brain uh -huh. and it alleviates depression. It's crazy. And yeah. now they have a better one. The Stanford, Stanford has it. It's called- the Stanford Prison Experiment? Yes. Uh, it's Stanford. I don't trust anything it's like, out of Stanford. Yeah. It's, yeah. Um, I don't, it's, there's some good okay. acronym like okay. spider or something. That's okay. like, that's five times the power of the one I got. I went to China to get it. Um, I've done good magnets there. They got some of the best and they're not regulated. They make them there. Uh, EMDR. Sure. I did that. Helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, mildly for me, just a bunch of stuff. Finally, I got to, did you do electroconvulsive therapy? I didn't. I think it's for, I think that's for a more severe level than I have. Mm -hmm. So, and then finally I like was out of, not out of options, but kind of like reached like, is there more? Can I get more? It is a form of weird greed. It's like an emotional greed of, of nah, it's better. There's something better. There's, it's like sending yeah, it back. Like, no, this isn't if, quite right. I don't right. know if wanting to feel better in your skin is greed. Right. But I'm saying it. I don't say that with any judgment. I say it as, I won't say it's not earnest, but there is a selfishness to it. Like, I believe I deserve to experience more joy. Mm -hmm. I, that's a good, I, let's say it's good selfishness, right? And, and then finally, I, after... Would that every listener of this podcast would say, I deserve to experience more joy. Yeah. Why don't you? Yeah. Why don't you? Yeah. It's like, fuck, if everyone else is experiencing it. Yeah. Why shouldn't and can you? can you do three things in a week to help you experience more joy? Yeah. And and I'm lucky in that I have a little bit of gold and right. I can I can Fly pursue. To China and have magnets yes. put on your skull. Yeah. It's a, that again, we all have to genuflect privilege. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. Finally, I got to ayahuasca, uh, mm -hmm. which I'd heard was a good antidepressant. Yeah. Vaguely. And mm -hmm. then somebody sent me an article from the New York Times. Because uh, I'm at the age where I get my drug ideas from the New York Times, and, <laughs> the, and gray, the gray lady. Yeah, and we, uh, I did it probably 15 times, and I got better, less depressed every time. And then I did, and I got not only did I got you have to stop taking antidepressants to do it, and not only did I go off antidepressants to do it, I stayed off them, and be in the third night i stopped being an atheist and i want to get to that yeah i love this story i've heard little nibbles of it uh, -huh. uh that you've told some other place and i want to do a deep dive mm -hmm. i want to do the deepest possible mm -hmm. dive on the god that you found through ayahuasca but first similar to the god you found in your book or that you it, whatever yeah yeah i want to push on this a little bit um I want to say that anyone that's doing hallucinogens because they're clinically depressed They've tried everything else and they need a way out or they're clinically addicted. They've tried everything else and they want a way out. I'm amen for that. So I'm all, I'm I'd like, all can in. I do my own pre I'm all in. My, uh, I have so much more to say. Are you these, sure you want to say this right now? Well, I just want to say as someone who's done almost 20 times ayahuasca. Uh, um, went from 15 be careful. to 20 now. Be careful. Let me get to part two of my dialogue, my diatribe here. First of all, I hate the words plant medicine because mm -hmm. you know what else is a plant? Heroin. Mm -hmm. You know what else is a plant? Cocaine. Mm -hmm. Don't give me your plant medicine bullshit. It's, I, I'll it feels, do my best. It feels, it feels like a justification. I also get a little bit tired of the, um, the contemporary idea of uh, instant uh, spiritual enlightenment due to a drug. Because I am old enough to remember people talking about LSD in the same way in the early 70s. And they're going to start talking about it again soon. And they are now. I remember people talking about mushrooms and peyote that way in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And there's always been a component of society that has said, well, you can find God, you can find divinity, you can find meaning and purpose and illumination through drugs. And... I get a little scared because you have all of these very powerful influencers talking about, you know, doing ayahuasca or, or, or acid or, or, and hallucinogens. And 
it's a, it can be dangerous. I've also met a guy, I've met several people, including an uncle of mine who completely fried their brains mm -hmm. from microdosing and overusing. And I do think that one can find um, the divine inspiration, transcendence, connection, yeah, incredible beauty in ways that don't involve drugs. Now, again, this is not a judgment on you at all. I respect your journey so much. Like when I hear about your life story, what you went through and what you've accomplished, and I truly mean this, Neil, like it's jaw dropping to me. And I've heard some of your ayahuasca stories and like, I want to get deeper, but I get a little scared about this. Um, uh, hey, everyone jump on into the hallucinogen uh, bandwagon. Totally agree. Yeah. Um, because the truth of it is I've had two experiences that were, I did, after the ayahuasca, I did DMT, Bufo, Alvarius. It's got three different names. But I don't know what that is. It's a toad venom. <laughs> you did a toad venom. Let me finish. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's one of the good ones. No, it's a, it's a toad secretion, not a venom. It's like a, you know, it's oh, like a okay, toad. Okay. Let's say it's a toad. Toad jism. Pimple. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like a pimp. They literally scrape the white and then they dry it and then you smoke it. It's basically pure DMT okay. and you freebase it. Okay. DMT is an, an ingredient Let's... in ayahuasca, but you drink it so your body breaks it down okay. and then it enters your bloodstream. So it's reptile medicine. Basically, yeah. And I did it and it was more severe than that. It was... So far past, I do a thing in blocks where I, I do like a montage of what it was kind of like. That doesn't even get to it. It was, I was so far past, I told somebody I was aiming for God and I missed my stop. <laughs> okay. I was, That's Michael amazing. Pollan did it and he said it was, and this is the, I had the same experience. It was like going to before the Big Bang. Wow. It's, you don't, you don't think about it long. Like, give yourself three seconds of what that would be like and then get out of there. Okay, so let's go right to the God thing. You do yeah. ayahuasca. You're a diehard atheist. Mm -hmm. And you witness the divine. What's that like? Talk us through it. I think a lot of people, especially in L.A. and a lot of the influencers and all that stuff, they're doing these drugs. I'll use your word. You and the cops. Um they're trying to optimize themselves. They're trying to be better workers. They're trying to be, I'm going to break through and then I'm going to be, it's the reason people out here juice and salad and hike. It's all to become famous. <laughs> I really believe that. It's all to get. I've never heard right... anyone comparing juicing, salading and hiking to, uh, to doing toad. They're all performance. They're ultimately performance enhancing drugs. That's how I think most people do them. I did them because I heard it would end depression, right? And then I had- Which I respect, mad respect. Yeah, but I think most people are doing it to just like, so that I can- And, and I think I'm, most people are also doing it because they're lazy. Because I want to go for a I weekend totally down agree. to Costa Rica. I totally agree. And, and I want to pay a shaman $1,200 and I want to have a shortcut to transcendence. Yes. Instead of reading so they the They call great it books. spiritual bypass. Um, and I don't even know if my depression reasoning is the right reasoning. I, I kind of think it's better than trying to be a better, uh, actor, writer, director, whatever, but that's, again, that's my own judgment. So, so I do it first night. I do it one weekend and it was, I just had a really nice experience. like a very pleasant, mm -hmm. I cried for like three hours straight to the, wow. point. and I wasn't even crying. It was kind of joyful crying. I was crying about groups of people i don't even like groups of people i just was i like it What's was like hypnotheria what is what, did, what were you diagnosed with about joy dysthymia so was it the first time you experienced joy it would not again it's not like i never experienced it but it's just always a little like i i always had the feeling like there's better there's better one than this yeah so it was not quite that but it was very 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 loving and warm that's great yeah uh, then I go, that's one on a Saturday night. And then a month or two later, I go to a weekend. First night, the medicine uh, just didn't work. Do you love the, how about Psychonaut? Do you like Psychonaut? Um, <laughs> there, a buddy of mine named Carl Hart wrote a book called Drug Use for Grownups that you would enjoy. Uh, okay. He believes you can do heroin a little and you can do meth a little. Yeah, and he's a professor at Columbia. He's that's head of, right up my alley. Head of, head of yeah, neuroscience yeah. or something. Second night, 
drink it and I'm the thing about ayahuasca to me is you kind of go inside the fabric of existence. What does that feel like? Can you describe it more it's specifically? It's so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Um where you're you're inside the essence of I you had a lot of I mean they're not your words but the the, the Native American mm -hmm. Tonka whatever Wakan Tonka yeah, yeah the uh, the the Lakota definition of the great mystery of God that's not a personification at all it's not an old man with a beard I've never it's once a, thought it was a person yeah. since I since I got back into it after this night I never thought it was a person never thought it was a man never in Aya they say like mother it's never been gendered to me somebody told me that that started in the early 2000s gendering the what i call the central creation force you're just like oh oh it was i opened my eyes and it was raiders of the lost ark the very end before the faces melt when the angels are just flying around which is a little terrifying when those angels are flying around yeah it's not pretty angels They're right like but it's also ill-gotten so i think that Okay. Covers it. Um, look, an antiquities belong to American white people. And, <laughs> and I think that's the point of the movie. Um, I've but, been to the British Museum. Yeah, exactly. So it was just like, a, oh, okay. Because I grew up Catholic, altar boy, church, all that stuff for 12 years. And you just end up, church ends up just being, I kind of believe that most religious ceremonies in, as we understand them, not, are pretty close to spiritless. And they're a a road production or like a high school production of the thing that you can experience there is a central that's a, gra they, that's a great way of putting it they yeah. get they there is a central creation force but it doesn't care about any it's of like the a things. community theater production of the big bang as yes opposed to the big bang yes itself. and like they do this and they're like that's ayahuasca and the know. thing the swing yeah they yeah, have the slow gun yes yeah. Yeah. and you're like this is lost in translation there is a central creation force that again that i believe in and that i believe i've experienced and it doesn't care what you eat doesn't care if you're gay doesn't care how you pray it doesn't care it doesn't it I talked to Pete Holmes about this recently where it's the central creation force that I've experienced isn't a person. So the idea of it having rules right. is silly mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. before you even get into the rules. Mm -hmm. They're silly. And it real the reading in, in so like the, why? the, the this for it's a force. It's a, and then, so, but, but I have a couple questions, but, Talk me through what else you saw, witnessed, experienced, felt. How did it touch your heart? You had some kind of, you touched the central creation force. Give us some more details. It felt like generations of humanity were kind of in this frequency. Thou like thousands which is again of years. very close to the native american idea because it's very hard and from what little i know of native american spiritual experience like ancestors are always brought in it's always like god of our ancestors connecting with the ancestors yeah i have a joke about the ancestors where i'm like if you're black or brown or indigenous go ahead and pray to your ancestors white people do not pray to your ancestors <laughs> Um, so, so I could, I didn't see pasty. Irish I have an people. ancestor, a great, great grandfather who literally killed native Americans by the score yeah. in North Dakota and Minnesota. So I'm not going to pray to his spirit. You're double fucked by that. Cause you can't pray to the natives and you can't pray to I'm, the guy who I'm killed screwed. him. So yeah, I can have a podcast. You're in a tough spot. You're yeah. in a tough spot. So uh, there, it felt like that. It felt like. It just felt like an under, a, a way bigger did, picture. Did you hear anything? Did this cre central creative force speak to you in no. any way? I've never heard anything. I've mm -hmm. never uh, experienced, like, what happens a lot of times after these ceremonies is everyone shares, and it's everyone's trying to out. And I felt like the yeah. angels the Yeah, everyone's spat trying to out and revelation and ribbons. how special their experience was. Yeah, I don't have anything... I can point to as, especially not an ayahuasca, a couple times ago. But how do you know that there's a central creation force from doing a drug? Couldn't you have someone who's an atheist said like, well, you took a drug. 
and it lit up this one part of your brain that made you believe that there was yeah, some force I'm outside totally of yourself. Yeah, I'm totally willing to accept that that could also be true. Yeah. It sure doesn't feel like it. Mm. Uh, you know. And what is your connection to this central creative force since ayahuasca? What is, how does that work on a daily basis, on a weekly basis? Do you communicate with it? Are you able to uh, touch it in meditation? Is there, is there an aspect of prayer? Have you had glimpses of it in nature? In, in beautiful love making, in, in witnessing. I am of art. more loving. I am more loving. I'm funnier. Mm -hmm. uh, this is after the DMT, too, which is eight months of like, you know, I, there was a couple of days where I'm like, I think I'm going to have to kill myself. It's like two years ago. I was like, I can't, I can't bear this because I was wow, that's awake and I was, I was half here and half there. So you meant you had to kill yourself during that I process because it, it, so it was so horrific. unbearable. It was so, I wouldn't have wished it on Hitler. I remember thinking that, like, yeah. I wouldn't wish this on Adolf Hitler. I've heard that about ketamine and uh, and K-holes. I've heard about that, people feeling that exact I've same done thing. ketamine. I did ketamine treatment also. Um, I didn't, didn't work for me. But it was, it was just, un, I had the thought, am I in God's imagination? Shit that's just way past where you're supposed to be. You are in God's imagination. We all are. That's a beautiful way of putting it. I don't, right, but I think I, it's real. So, and I think it is physically here. It is a physical thing. So I don't think, I think it's like your, you guys weren't in Ricky's imagination. The British cast was, <laughs> kind of, but like it's, it's, it's tangible. That's it's the actual. first time that Ricky Gervais has ever been compared to a god he doesn't oh, believe not, in. <laughs> well, hey, Ricky doesn't believe in it. He, yeah, but couldn't God? He, he believes that, himself, which to him is the same thing. There is a Hindu idea of a god that every time it blinks its eyes, there's a new universe that's created. You know, there's the idea. Could God's? There's an Ursula K. Le Guin book. I think it's the the dark side of the shadow of the something. People will put it in the comments below. Where. This guy lives in his, his dreams come true and he comes in manifest and he lives inside of his dreams. Could we all be in the living yeah, dream I just think of the central too, creative force? I don't have the tolerance for sci-fi that you do. <laughs> and I don't, I don't like, it's like when people go, is it a simulation? Shut the fuck up. I just don't, it's not helpful for okay. me to think like it's simulation. It's almost a form of conspiracy theory to me. <laughs> where where like well, it's a simulation so i'm not responsible for what i do and i'm being fucked i'm being manipulated it's like no i believe this is actual and we make choices and there are consequences and i have a car and i'm here um you have a so black tesla i do thank you day to day a lot of it is in my nervous system i've had so many people come up and be like you're lighter I got better on stage because I'm 10% lighter. I get bigger laughs than I've ever gotten because I'm 10% lighter from ayahuasca and DMT. I believe. It's made me fall in love easier. Uh, it m gives me a little distance from my nervous system, from my reactive nervous system, a little bit. I yell less. I'm less like generally angry. I can watch myself more. And like, kind of, what are you doing? What would you have been like on this podcast? Angrier. For three or four years Angrier. ago. Angrier. And would you have been a more judgy? Like, who is this guy? Like, oh, this guy wants to talk about spirituality. No, or I just would have, no. Sitcom I mean, actor. Like, uh, would you have been kind of like? I would have been just generally angrier. Do you connect with this power at all? Even in nature and something? I, I, I bring that up because like, I do meditation pretty much daily. And I have this little bench out in my backyard. And I live in a really privileged place. I live in a really nice house with beautiful trees. Thank you. Sometimes I just can't meditate. So I just can't do it. Yeah. I'm just like, I can't fucking do this. And then I just sit and I just look. And there's a hummingbird. And there's a sunlight streaming through a 50-year-old olive tree. And there's a flower blooming. And I hear a, a cricket. And I am able to be like, I'm with God. This this beauty, this majesty, this, this mystery, uh, it almost makes me cry. It's just so beautiful. And then I just get to sit in witness of it. And that 
can be a kind of meditation. And maybe I'm, you know, there's, I've got hippie parents. So there's, you know, I do have a hippie side of me. Yeah. Okay. So uh, after the ayahuasca and after the DMT. Is that just dumb? No. The, now, at, since I've done those two things in a major way and kind of opened up something in myself, um, whenever I do mushrooms or MDMA, it's that. Why do you keep doing them? How long are you going to keep doing these hallucinogens? I don't know. I, the, in a weird way, it kind of feels like upkeep, meaning I get a lot. It's a continuation of that spirit and that, or that channel. And I get almost more from MDMA than I've got from ayahuasca and DMT. From MDMA, I've gotten uh, I, the, my understanding of like, oh, this is nature is God. And I had another couple big things from MDMA that I am like that are shareable, whereas the the Aya stuff is just more in your body. One of them was I I have I'm I'm a grudge holder, and one day on MDMA, I was able to release all of my grudges with ease, with absolute ease, right? And then the next day I was like, why was that so easy for me? And it was because I was flooded with dopamine, oxytocin, um, the other one, um, and the other feel-good chemical. So it was easy for me to forgive people. It was like I was, it was just an easy thing. Like some people are temperamentally more forgiving, I would argue, because they have better chemicals. I realize the reason I'm so sort of obsessed with justice and fairness and retribution is because I don't, I, those are the chemicals I have. I have, you know, cortisol and like more negative ones. Yeah. And the way cortisol to me organizes itself is vengeance, yeah. righteousness. Yeah. Those are sort of like the smiles yeah. of cortisol is, is like that organizational thing. So that got me to, I don't even believe what I think I believe. It's just what the chemicals are telling me I believe every day. I'm just, the only thing that this kitchen serves is, is mercury sandwiches. <laughs> and I just have tried to every morning remind myself that these are just chemicals. This isn't even a set belief system because on Friday I was vengeful. Saturday I totally you forgave. Loved yeah. Totally forgave everyone. I've also gotten a thing where I've just been because I just like wrote a will, uh, like a you know, like a legal will in the case I should die, in the unlikely event, in the impossibility that and I, I die. Can I have one thing? Yeah. In your will. Can I have one thing? Yeah. Will you just put like a yep. a plate or something or like a salad fork or like I left a Chappelle a dollar. Just because it's fucking hilarious. It's hysterical. It's hilarious. That's hysterical. So that's been death has just been on my mind a lot. Mm -hmm. And I and then one time on MDMA, I heard a voice, you're gonna die soon. And I was like, Yo, what are you talking about? <laughs> Whoa. Like, yo. Creative cosmic. And they were like, force. No, 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 it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And what I've come to believe may it's potentially all in my imagination. Like high very likely it's all in my us, imagination. Let's put all of yeah. those apology statements aside. So chemicals all yeah. could be imaginary. Yes. We get yes. it. Caveats. And but what I've come to believe is if you don't enjoy this more, we're going to kill you. And oh. it's been an interesting approach mm. where every day I write in a, hey, you are so, you're having a 1% of 1% of 1% human experience. Mm -hmm. And you're a fucking asshole if you don't see that and appreciate it and if you don't start we're gonna kill you so it's like the movie speed <laughs> <laughs> but i have to enjoy myself you have to it's like a setup for a movie it's yeah. like a jim carrey movie from, yes, the, from, from the 90s yeah. like yes. if you don't enjoy yourself every day you're going to yes. explode yes yeah that's basically and so he's like every day jim carrey's yeah. like yeah, yeah juggling fire eating and going on a roller coaster yeah but can't you pray to this what what is stopping you from praying to this cosmic, beautiful, creative force. I don't, because I don't, because I have everything. Commune, commune. I have everything. That's, but I'm not saying that. Praying doesn't mean give me more. 
Praying is connecting. I see the writing in the journal as a form of prayer. It's okay. a form of appreciation. Okay. It, am I gamifying it? Yeah. But I also wore a wristband that shocked me, so I smile. Like, you know, I, I, I believe that I need, people need, like, parameters and need motivators and need a reason to do, a, a reminder. Because it's a very easy reminder. You, you might walk around being like, I'm so bummed today. I think I'm so bummed. And I better stop or they're going to kill me. That's incredible. <laughs> no, it's really funny. I was funny. watching this documentary last night with my wife, and it's one of the most powerful and devastating things I've ever seen. It's called Beyond Utopia, and it's basically about North Koreans trying to get out of North Korea. Mm. And I had a similar thought. It wasn't like, oh, you're going to die, but it's like, Rain, you cannot fucking complain about anything because you by the luck of the lottery, got born into suburban Seattle and have ended up in Hollywood and you haven't been born in North Korea. And the, the starvation, the torture, the brainwashing, um, like just roll of the dice, that could have been me. And feel joy and spread joy. Go to it. Get it. Have at it. The feel odds joy of joy. a life like yours or mine yeah, like you There's said, all it's one percent of one percent of one percent. Yeah, those stats yeah. about just being a just being born a human baby, and then you follow this dream or talent, and you end up here. And also, we're weird looking. Oh, come on, I don't join identify me. as join, a weird looking. But you know what's you funny about I don't. I when I I've been watching my special for You're not three unhandsome. weeks. I'm not unhandsome. You well, here's the but thing: we're is, not. We look like something. I can draw you. <laughs> I, I mean that sincerely. You could be at Knott's Berry Farm and do a sketch yeah, of like, me. Yeah, like <laughs> Chris Rock's not good looking. Dave's not good looking. But you know what they look like. Okay. And that's kind of the name of the game. That is kind of a thing. And me, then it's add an, talent and charisma. It's memorable. Yeah. The other day I said to my wife, you are so interesting. And she goes, that's not a compliment. And I said. It absolutely is. It's it is actually the best yes. compliment that you yes. can ever give someone. That yeah. they are. My wife is deeply, deeply fucking interesting. Yeah, but it's very hard to appreciate. I, I have a, it's kind of a joke that's not ever going to be good enough, but, but church is every week because we need it every week. And there's churches every, every other block because that's about how long church lasts. You leave church and you're like, you know what? I'm going to be a rah, rah, And then you just get, you just, and yep. then by two blocks later, you're like, fuck everyone. All right, church. I'm, you know, I'm going to be a good person. You're into the per cortisol. Yeah. yeah. And, and. Well, Arthur Brooks goes to mass every single day. I, the older I get, the more I agree with Muslims playing five times a day. Yeah. It's, that's about right. Yeah. You, they still forget. Yeah. <laughs> you by the can't. third hour. <laughs> They're like, what the fuck? But it's a good idea. Yeah. It's no one's, you know, I'm sure they have all the hallmark. They forget. What they forget. Would, and what they... would stop Neil Brennan from, instead of bowing to Mecca five times a day, mm -hmm. bowing to, acknowledging, surrendering to, what did you call it? The, the, cos... the central creation force. The central creation force five times a day. What would stop you from doing nothing. that? I, nothing. Nothing. There's, that... no, there's no reason why what, I shouldn't do that. What would that look like? An alarm? What would follow? What would the ritual, the ceremony, the... Uh, uh, I think I would probably say, please help me appreciate this. Please help me experience more joy. Please help me understand how fortunate I am. Can you try that for one day and get back yeah, to me I just really for will. one day? I never know, thought of it before. And let me know how that works just for one day. Yeah. Five times in a day. If you can send it. I'll an, an try alarm to guess your... where you are in the world and I'll pray in that direction. Your, your Mecca. You're my Mecca. Oh, wow. You're, it's, you're Medina. You're somewhere between. I'm Medina. north off the 101. That's all you need to <laughs> great, know. Great. That's a great uh, north uh, star. But yeah, I, I think everyone should. One of my favorite books that I'm always trumpeting is a book by Anne Lamott. She's in recovery. She's Christian. She's uh, hysterical. She wrote a book called Help, Thanks, Wow. And those are the three kinds of prayers. Help, thanks, and wow. You mm. can ask for help. You can say creative cosmic force, help me do this or protect this family member from this or please help with this. But you can also say, thank you. I'm the 1% of the 1% of the 1%. Oh my God, thank you, beautiful. 
cosmic force, but you can also just say, wow. And maybe that's what it is. Five times of you saying, wow. Yeah, and all of my help that I need is saying, wow. Do you know what I mean? Like, I need help for getting to thanks and yeah. wow. Because I, I, I don't know if I'm especially programmed or humans are, but, I'm, you know, we're scanning for threats. Yeah. We're, we're, we're looking for slights. We're looking yep. for changes in people's facial. Yeah. We're wired to, uh, for anxiety, anxiety. We talk about this all the time in the book and various interviews. Anxiety kept the human species alive. Yeah. Here's, that's why we're here. That's why we've been here for a hundred thousand years. Cause our Do anxiety. You, does your body think you have enough money? Does my body think, think that? you have enough yes. money? Yes. It So you, you're. I've never had a, I've never had a money thing. I've had a please love me thing. Got it. Does your body think you're being loved enough? I, I struggle with that yeah. on a daily basis. Yeah. And I don't, I struggle with all of it. I'm saying it's, you know, I've, had, I've asked people sometimes like, how much money do you need? Well, there's that famous quote by uh, Rockefeller who said, when asked by a journalist how much money is enough, and he said, just a little bit more. Yeah, I've heard it's twice what I have now. We are wired to live in just a little bit more. Well, it's most of our identities is the, you know, your successful. When people look at you, they go, that guy's successful. I it's, wish I could lose 20 pounds. You could. I'm not willing to make the sacrifice that that would entail. Uh, in closing, I think, and that doesn't have to be, but I'm, uh, that I wish I had more day-to-day -day enjoyment, minute-to-minute -minute enjoyment, appreciation. What's the other one? Help, thanks, wow. Yeah. But yeah, I, I don't... But I love the help that I need is just in more wow. Yeah. Help me get more wow. Help me get more wow. Even though it's right here. It's in the title. Wow. It, it is hard. I it's hope just you're hard able to, to find more wow without the help of psychedelics. But maybe that's my own personal agenda. And you do you, babe. And... Everything's working, groovy, baby. And it's so groovy. But I, I share a real caution. My worry is that because it's becoming more and more and more mainstream and there's this positivity bias, no one talks about the downside. No one says, hey, I love this stuff and it almost made me kill myself. I'm better off having on the coming out on the other side of it, but... I'm very aware that people do. I would say I was like pre-psychotic. Was it worth it? If it was, it was by the slimmest margin. I don't think I would do what I did again. It's one of the reasons I really wanted you on because you walk that line between just hilarity jokes, but also like you share like a lot of- Overshare. Deep, you overshare the deepest, darkest parts uh -huh. of any human experience. but. But let's go back in time a little bit. I don't want to talk about the whole Chappelle show thing, mm -hmm. although this audience, I don't know how much they know, but Neil was the producer, co-creator of Chappelle show, which became almost instantly like the biggest show in cable television history. And then Chappelle on left DVD. It. <laughs> Literally on, it was the highest selling TV show ever on DVD. But I, I would watch it on the actual no, of course. MTV. It was on, yeah, it was, yeah. We would wait and, oh my God, yeah, new one, there's comedy, new It was Comedy Central. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, whatever. what's funny is I, we're not directly linked, but but my buddy Mike Schur was writing for SNL. And then I think after the first season of Chappelle Show, he moved to uh, LA to work on the American remake of The Office. And it was like, all right. But, and it was kind of like, good luck. Okay, it, yeah. Yeah, it was like, okay, it seems like you're not going to yeah. be able to do that. But it yeah. turns out they did. <laughs> it did okay. But the thing that, and that story has been told a lot about Chappelle leaving mm -hmm. and blah, blah, blah. But the thing that I find really inspiring and puzzling is you are literally at the very top of your game as far as TV writer, TV producer. Yeah. And you could have instantly gone over to SNL or created another sketch show or uh, just become a TV producer. After a period of time, which I want to hear about, you kind of reinvented yourself by going back to your roots as a stand-up and doing stand-up comedy in coffee houses for 30 people to kind of build sets of material and kind of cut your chops, hone your chops, and become a professional stand-up comic. Mm -hmm. And not only that, like 
you have risen to the top echelon where if you ask average stand-up comic on the street, you're absolutely in the top 10. And that transition, all while battling serious mental health issues such as low depression, and we'll talk about that later on, that's a, it's absolutely a remarkable story. I don't think I've heard that before in showbiz, and I want to dig into that a little bit. Cool. Um, yeah, I, so the show ends. The show ends. 2005. You're already dealing with mental health, depression, yeah. alienation, loneliness, yeah. disconnection on a lot of different levels. I'd done stand-up maybe a handful of times before he left, and maybe 50 times. So over 10 years or something. So... I directed a movie, didn't do good, and then, but I was doing stand up then, and I just realized, like, thing about doing stand up is you in in proper showbiz, there's just a ton of people telling you you're not funny and your ideas aren't good. So I was like, I'm pretty sure I'm funny, I'm pretty yeah. sure I'm funny. Yeah. Like, and then so that was sort of the impetus, and then just not struggle. Well, yeah, I guess I struggled. Like, I wasn't, I didn't really know how to do it. Do it. And it takes six to 10 years to really understand what you're doing. I'm still under getting better at understanding it. So 15 years into it or 16. So it was like emceeing kind of like the ground going, driving to Irvine, driving to Brea, doing 10 minutes or 15 minutes or whatever. I think there was a notion that I was like kind of an interloper or like, you're just doing this, doing it for what it's not, it's, I'm as embarrassed as anyone. Maybe I'm more embarrassed than you because I already did a thing. Was there some kind of dark night of the soul that led you to do it? Because I'm really fascinated by someone, you know, at, at the top of the game uh, in one field and you go to a, a, a connected field, a related field. Yeah. It's not like you went into dentistry and starting at the bottom. Well, you know, yeah, it's, but, a, it's, yeah. it's Michael Jordan going Play to baseball, baseball yeah. but, but it's... But it's more like Michael Jordan going and, uh, you know, joining the Harlem Globetrotters and being the very best at spinning a basketball or something like that. Yeah. Well, that it was it was Cause there's no pay. Yeah, there's there's um, zero. There's really zero pay for years. That's true. Um, and it was more people in proper showbiz thought, oh, it was all Dave, huh? Mm. So it was like. And I didn't want to so be like, I'll tell you element, what I wrote, because me and David so had a deal, was, like, was, not say what we wrote. So is it, is it was it really like I'm I'm gonna prove them wrong? So there was an element I'm gonna show them. Yeah. And that's that's okay. Yeah. That's part of my acting career was like Oh, I'm you don't think I'm gonna, I can, yeah. Yeah. I've I was I was rejected at every turn. And, and I, I'll also say I don't like show business. Hmm. I don't like I don't like the people. People are you gonna do another movie? I'm like, I hope not. Do you want to join me in beekeeping and ceramics? No, that's the problem. Uh, I don't have a pot to piss in. Um, <laughs> are you making pots, piss pots? Um, I don't like showbiz. I don't like movie producers. I don't like the tone. I don't like the power structure. I don't like the... the most of it's not good. It's incredibly arrogant people. And most... It's like, what do you guys see what you're making? And so, so I was kind of happy to be... <laughs> You do a movie and then it doesn't go good. That's pretty much it. It's an all-in bet. Yeah. So I like homemade stuff. I like doing stuff. No one's around. I make it. I show it to somebody. They so think. So it's DIY. There's a punk rock DIY element to stand up of like, I'm going to write these jokes. Yes. I'm going to go get these laughs. Yep. I'm going to do it on my own. Yes. And I don't have to like pitch it to agents. And no. Um, and it's funny. I'll, I'll just tell a, a story and I don't, Please. I don't know if we'll use it or not. I'll cut it out. I spent, uh, thanks so much. I spent years writing a screenplay with a friend of mine who's a brilliant writer and he's got movie options. He's got plays going to Broadway. He's a delightful human being. I sent it to my agents. It's for me to direct. It's a horror science fiction movie, which seems to be commercial these days. I'm so excited about it. And I literally have my team meeting and they're like, yeah, you should just find some uh, A-list actors and try and get them attached to the movie. Mm -hmm. and I was like, uh, is, that, is that it? Is that your, your advice? Well, yeah, no, exactly. So that's, that, that's it. You want, you want me to just do it myself? I'm just going to package and put together this movie by myself. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks for your time. Thanks for reading the script. 
Right. But it's similar to when you book a job or whatever. And they go, well, it's here's the offer. And you go, all right, what's the counter? And they're like, ah, <laughs> there's no counter. You, if you have a quote, which is generally what your final salary on the office was, that'll be around what you expect to make on other things that you're the lead on or one of the leads. And then they go, ah, they can't meet it. And you go, so what are we, are you going to get them to meet it? Ah, and you go, so what are you doing? This is what they have budgeted. Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. And it's they're, full they're, of people like that. They're taking phone calls. And I would argue most good stuff is just a person, two people, and maybe they don't have good boundaries. Maybe they're working too hard. But, you know, so I, South Park comes to mind. Like, just, just, they just do their thing in the warehouse. Yeah. And they don't, everything's all set. And they, then they go home or whatever they do. So, so. I don't really like it. I didn't want to write. I didn't want to just be stuck in a room. That's a, the other part of why I did stand up right. is because I didn't like. You didn't want to join another writer's I didn't, room. I, yeah, and like, spend I, fourteen hours a day with some yeah. stinky comedy writers. And yeah, or yeah, which I I like comedy writers, but I mean I am a comedy writer, but I didn't want to just sit there in the flannel and the and just like eating snacks and sort of. The way me and Dave did it was I would I we I would have an index index card. It's the, it's my whole life uh, of just like ideas. I'd write ideas and then he go, hey, uh, put on the card something something something. I go, okay, and then we we write for a couple of days every few weeks. But it wasn't organized in any way. Wow, it was just very disorganized. Wow. And so that's kind of what I'm used to. And anything good I've done has been do it here. Yeah, improve it, improve it, improve it, improve it, improve it, and then well, you didn't can Louis C.K. do that very effectively when he was doing his TV show? He said, the like, so I'm well. gonna do the, "Yeah, like, I'm gonna just do my TV show. I'm gonna write it. I'm gonna yep. direct it. I'm gonna produce it. I don't want any notes." Yep. And uh, that was doing pretty well yeah. for a while. So I, I mean, don't... I think I think everyone in in our side of of Hollywood were just really like, "Wow, that's really admirable." I've <laughs> known Louis. I was a PA on his first short in 1991 wow so i've been around louis and dave and john stewart and all these people and i see that it's pretty you just do it yourself it's just the best way to do it anything mm -hmm. else is a is a factory yeah and it, it gets watered down and it gets even Chappelle one time was like even if it's bad it's our bad yeah which is which yeah. i agree which with. you can live with yeah i had a real breakthrough about show business a few years back and and it was very, very simple. And I wonder if there's a spiritual truth that underlies it, which is constant rejection, minimalization, being shot down, disappointment, nonstop. And it was just very, a very, very clear, still voice inside of me said, Rain, you signed up for this. Mm -hmm. And it immediately just lifted so much. It's like, and that, and that is one of my very favorite jokes is like, how do you make an actor unhappy? Give him a job. Mm -hmm. But show business is filled with people like venting about their disappointment and, and, and flagellating about, you know, rejection and, uh, you know, being shot down. And it's like, well, then don't be in show business because there's a lot. If you're a CPA, you're not going to experience rejection. You know? Right, and you're not going to experience huge payouts. You're not going to experience residuals. You're not going. To, you're not going to experience a lot of upside. I always say that and adoration and and whatnot. Yes, it's kind of like being in Vegas, and it's like, well, then don't be in Vegas if you don't want to. It's a more, I think, uh, spiritually mature way of looking at like, well, um, suck it up. But you chose to be in this in this milieu, yeah, and so. That just, that helped me a great deal. It's like, oh yeah, rejection, disappointment. Well, the, it's again, the rejection's coming. It's like my showbiz record is like three and nine. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. it's not, but the three are get you through the nine. Yeah. But it's what even, or two or one or I, whatever it is. That's great. It's a losing record and you're still one of the most successful people doing it. Mine is literally like two and 20 yeah and you i because don't know basically what, uh, every movie i've done no one has ever watched or cared about yeah, yeah. I, I yeah and, like i'm uh, in the same boat i got so. a couple of tv shows that did pretty well and yeah 
There we go. Yep. And yep. Yeah. And that's and you're a real winner. Yep. <laughs> I'm doing twenty and I'm a real winner. Yeah. Yeah. You're and came out you're on like, top. Yeah. yeah. And you get recognize everywhere you go a look, lot. I got, an, I got a nice podcast studio. Look at, yeah, look at a little country shabby chic. We have talked about a number of different things uh, and we've talked a lot about depression, anxiety, even suicide, um, panic attacks, uh, low self-esteem, cortisol, struggle, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. What a we've also talked about joy and your seeking of joy. So let's, let's leave it on an up note. How do we find increased pleasure that we can share that connects us to that great creative force? Uh, it's obvious, but you kind of have to believe it in the first place. There's things that in my life, ha Hasan Minhaj said one time, it was like, you know, because when I was an atheist, he'd be like, look at your life. How can you be an atheist? And I agree with him. He's like, it, this is not normal. And even being an atheist and doing Chappelle show and a bunch of stuff. And, and there is the, it always was, there always was a spirit in it or that it drove it in the kind of way, but like the unknowable, the, the native thing, um, the unknowable, unspeakable, ineffable force They're all, I always had it. Mm. So I think connecting to it, I am not a person that gets runner's highs or, or, um, or like, you know, endure, like I just, from doing that, I got, but if there are things in your life that you do that feel, I didn't manifest anything, but something, some things are kind of in you that you have to birth. There's a, there was a quote I read a long time ago, uh, at like an, under a painting and it said the purpose of one's life is to give birth to themselves. Mm. And a lot of our lives, and maybe it's egotistical or something, but it is uh, tuning into what you, the suspicion you have about yourself and trying to make it actual. That to me is, a, is very God connected. It's achievement based, but it's also God connected. And one of my things is like, I would like to be, uh, more joyful because I think it'll it's good for the earth. Joy is a service. You're you're giving joy to others by making them laugh with your yeah. special. And I can make them more laugh more if I were more joyful, I believe. So mm. it's not again, it's a little self serving, but I think connecting to a quiet part of yourself and trying to honor that. I love what you said about that deep suspicion you have about yourself. Yeah. Honoring that and letting that give birth to your full potential. Yeah. That's a that's kind of a core belief. Even when I didn't believe in God. I I, I was believing in God. Even though I wasn't, uh, you know, doing anything. Or I didn't think I did. But I was maybe behaving in God. How many miracles brought us to this situation where we're having this conversation behind these two mics in this beautiful little shabby chic kitchen set, uh, having gone through what we've been through, it's infinite miracles, mm -hmm. infinite miracles. Yeah, you can't, it's here. incalculable. It's almost, it's one of those things where it's almost not possible to even appreciate it. it I'm, I'm trying, but some of it's so insane. It's how, how, how? Thanks, Neil. Thanks for coming on the old soul boom. Of course. Of course. God, goodbye, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.